Hi, and welcome to The Horn, a podcast from International Crisis Group. I'm Alan Boswell. We haven't talked much on this podcast about Eritrea yet, in part because it's just so difficult to do so. So we're pleased to have Martin Plout with us as our guest today. Martin is an author and journalist and currently a senior research fellow at the University of London. He's been covering Eritrea for almost 40 years. In this episode, we talk with Martin about President Isaias Afreki's unyielding grip on power and regional ambitions, as well as Eritrea's uncertain future. Martin, welcome to the podcast. Oh, it's a pleasure. So we've talked a lot on this podcast about the big political shifts going on in the Horn of Africa region. We have the transitions in Sudan, Ethiopia, the shifting Red Sea dynamics. Amid this, President Isaias appears to be enjoying some newfound regional influence. Exactly how does Eritrea fit into this new regional picture? And is President Isaias proving able to shape some of these developments to his advantage, despite the many years of isolation? Well, I think one of the things one must never underestimate about President Isaias is his ability to shape things. He has an extraordinary view of Eritrea, which is that it is the cornerstone of the whole of uh, the Horn of Africa. In fact, uh, he sees himself as, as a player within the whole of Africa. I mean, I don't know how many people remember, but he actually sent troops into the Democratic Republic of Congo and helped overthrow the previous government. So, I mean, he he has an amazing view of himself and uh, he certainly sees himself as a major player. Even when there were United Nations sanctions on Eritrea, he had a huge impact on uh, places like uh, Somalia and then Ethiopia, uh, being involved with Al-Shabaab, Uh, and some of the Islamist groups in um, Eritrea and in uh, Somalia. Really, I mean, he has had a huge influence uh, throughout the period of his his rule. So, of course, one of the major recent developments in the region is the rise of Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed in Ethiopia. And soon after he came to power, you saw this Ethiopia-Eritrea peace deal, uh, for which, of course, Prime Minister Abiy received the, the Nobel Prize. That was two years ago. What's happened since then? Initially, it had a very dramatic impact because, of course, Prime Minister Abiy went to Eritrea and the enthusiasm of the Eritrean people for his visit was astonishing. I mean, people came out in their tens of thousands, welcomed him. There was a huge optimism. Uh, The border was opened. Uh, uh, The... Prime Minister saw the president, saw President uh, Isaias, uh, President Isaias even took him to see his grandchildren, which is something I don't think I've ever seen happen. So there was this huge feeling that things were on the up. But gradually, uh, President Isaias began to see that there were real problems for him. For one thing, with the border open, people flooded out of the country, something like 5,000 plus a day simply took the road into Ethiopia and thought, this is our one chance to leave, and they left. And um, President Sars basically thought, this is terrible, I'm going to lose all my people. And he then uh, locked down the border, the border is once again closed, um, and all the subsidiary negotiations that should have taken place about how to solve the border issue that goes back to the war between Ethiopia and Eritrea of 1998 to 2000, um, none of them took place. None of those discussions uh, over what to do about the border took place. So, for example, there were some villages that were allocated uh, to one side of the border that were actually on the other. What do you do about that? Uh, If the border goes through a village, how do you share the land? All those questions need to be answered. And as far as we can see, None of those negotiations have actually taken place. How much of the lack of progress is also due to the regional power of, of Tigray in Ethiopia and, of course, the elite there and their you know, long-running dispute with um, President Isaias? Well, you, you put your finger on the most critical issue, absolutely. Uh, the relationship between Eritrea and the Eritrean government and the Tigrayan people is long and complex. Uh, I mean, they've sometimes fought side by side with each other um, against the um, the government in, in Ethiopia, and sometimes they fought against each other. And uh, I'm afraid there is there's some terrible 
historic precedents. I mean, I don't know how many people remember, but in 1984-85, in the Great Famine of Ethiopia, the Eritreans closed the border to Sudan and prevented grain, emergency grain, from going from Sudan into Tigray. And the Tigrayans had to evacuate something like 100,000 people so that they didn't starve. Now, the Tigrayans have never forgotten that, as you can imagine. And that has been the huge problem, is that the governments literally loathe each other. And uh, President Isaias is determined to try and end the, uh, the rule of the uh, Tigrayans in Tigray, the TPLF, which is the party that rules Tigray. And the Tigrayans, of course, uh, see him in much the same terms. President Isaias has used the unresolved border dispute with Ethiopia to keep Eritrea for a long time on a on a permanent quasi war footing. Um, there is a lot of speculation when the 2018 peace deal with Ethiopia and Eritrea was signed that this might weaken uh, President Isaias's grip somehow on power. Um, does that look like that has happened at all? No, I don't think so. I mean, one shouldn't forget that uh, President Isaias is the Eritrean state. I mean, he literally rules the country with perhaps a couple of dozen people, and there's nobody else that has any say in power whatsoever. There are no opposition parties allowed, there are no uh, free media, there's no judiciary, there's no uh, constitution. So he does what he likes, and quite frankly, at the mo as long as you have the guns with yourself, you can do whatever you want. So there is no suggestion that uh, President Isaias has in some way been weakened by what took place. And the fact that you have National Service conscripts who are now mobilized permanently, uh, ready for whatever's required, I mean, either for, uh, you know, fighting another war if that was to take place, or for just use in the mines, on the roads, anything else. Um, that hasn't really undermined him. Although people loathe going into it and flee the country, there's not much else they can do. Do you think there's any prospect of that national service being unwound while President Isaias is in power? Has it become too instrumental to his continuing rule? I think it's too instrumental to his rule. It is, it is absolutely clear that he, he not only feels that it is... Um, uh, the best way of, ru of running the country because uh, nobody else has a say in what's going on. But it, it also is important in, in a sense culturally because the one thing that he really loathed was uh, after 1991 when the, his forces took uh, the capital Asmara at the end of their 30-year war of uh, independence against Ethiopia, the one thing that he absolutely loathed was the fact that uh, the, the men and women who had been his troops in fighting that war, frankly, began to behave as if they were just civilians and no longer listened to him, began to challenge him. And, you know, there was actually an attempt to force him to give them decent pay. Uh, and, uh, you know, his troops forced him to come to a stadium to listen to them. And he absolutely hated that. And I think that, the, that in a sense, keeping people within a system that is so repressive just fits his kind of personality. And, uh, you know, it, it serves his, his regime's purpose, but also serves his personally. You, you mentioned, you know, to never underestimate his ability to, to shape matters. When you look at what's happening um, in the region with the transitions in Sudan and Ethiopia, where do you see his, his hand? Well, I think that he will do whatever he can in order to strengthen his own position and to maintain his um, grip on the, on the region such as it is. So, I mean, for example, if you take Djibouti, there is an ongoing border dispute that has not been resolved, despite endless attempts to do so. Um, relations with Sudan go up and down. Sometimes they're good. Sometimes they're very bad. Sometimes he has links with the opposition. Sometimes he links with the government in Khartoum. And, you know, all of these are a juggling uh, act that... And he sees himself as someone who can play whatever forces there are in the region. Uh, I mean, you only have to look at what he did in the situation in Yemen to see how he plays this. Yeah. So once he had good relations with Iran, those were dropped when he felt he had a better deal with um, the UAE and uh, the Saudis. And I think he probably got a lot of money in, in return. I don't mean personally, but I mean as a government. I mean, it is quite remarkable when you think of Eritrea's position and you look at the changes, you know, in its two big neighbors, Sudan and Ethiopia, and then, like you mentioned, the, the war in Yemen. 
right across the strait, and really it's all the region around it going through massive shifts. Um, how has the war in Yemen, you touched on it there, but how has the war in Yemen really changed Eritrea's sort of strategic significance? Well, it has meant that uh, the United Arab Emirates and the Saudis both see Eritrea as central to their um, war effort. Uh, I mean, the uh, UAE has a base in one of the ports of Asab, and uh, the Saudis use it as well. And they also fly um, jets uh, from there both to attack the uh, Houthi rebels in Yemen, but they also use it as a supply line uh, to their uh, links in in, uh, Libya, where they are also operational. So it becomes a regional power base and also a place, uh, the port of Asab is used by the UAE um, allegedly for torturing uh, and extracting confessions from Houthi rebels who are captured by them. So it is, it's a very useful place. Nobody can go and visit it. It's entirely off the radar. And uh, what's not to like from it if you're, if you're a ruler of uh, the UAE or uh, Saudi Arabia? I, I read a 2002 interview um, in which President Isaias gave, and he predicted Eritrea you know, w- would prove more and more strategic uh, to outside partners um, because Ethiopia would weaken internally as the Oromo demanded more power. And he also predicted the political crisis in Yemen would sort of threaten the political order. Those predictions coming from 2002 in some ways seem quite remarkable. D- sometimes we hear from interlocutors talk of President Zayas almost being, almost having a master plan and, you know, very much behind the scenes. Uh, shaping events, um, as, as you've mentioned. Do you think, how much do you think he's just been the recipient of these uh, new twists and, and fortune for him? And how much do you think he has been involved in actually shaping the, the region that he sits within? In a sense, I think it's both of those things. Uh, in one sense, he is uh, a past master at seeing weakness um, and finding a, a loophole in which he can operate. So, I mean, you know, he, he had no qualms about working with Islamists like Al-Shabaab when it, when it suited him. He dropped them like a hot brick when it didn't suit him any longer. Um, he's in no way an Islamist. Uh, that's certainly not his ideology. He has no love for them whatsoever. And it crushed the Islamist groups inside his own country. Uh, so he, he's utterly ruthless and is capable of doing anything that he, that he sees fit. And, you know, there, there aren't many people who are quite as tough as that, even in a region like the Horn of Africa. Um, as a result, he has been able to, uh, you know, basically shape things in the way that he wants to. At the same time, you know, people see him as a useful partner. So, for example, uh, both the European Union and the United States... Uh, which have interests in the region, are really not keen to see any anything that would topple uh, President Isaias because, you know, who knows what you get if you get rid of him? May be something worse. And I think that that is the sort of attitude that most of the outside international powers have about him. They don't like him, but who might come next? Yeah, and I want us to discuss the European approach to President Isaias and Eritrea here uh, a bit later. How would you describe his President Zayas' strategy right now towards the, the new government in Addis Ababa? Well, I suppose, you know, if, if I was going to be honest, I think that he, he sees them as uh, useful. He's prepared to tolerate them. After all, they are not Tigrayan. Um, they have led to a weakening of what was for many years his major opponent, uh, both in terms of the Tigrayans and in terms of Ethiopia as a whole. Um, I mean, many years ago, he predicted that without his support, the Ethiopian government would collapse. Uh, at the time, I certainly thought it was it was a crazy uh, prediction. But it, it, as you pointed out, you know, this has proved truer than, than one might have expected. Um, I mean, how this develops over a period of time, of course, is impossible to know. Uh, but he has been very, very shrewd in what in what he does. And this ability to to twist events to his ends has been extremely effective. Now, Eritrea still refuses to to participate in EGAD. Do you think President Isaias has a vision for a different sort of regional order? And, and, and what does that look like? I think the regional order that he'd like to see is one which takes uh, his view of Eritrea as being a linchpin of the region uh, seriously. 
uh, and you know he he doesn't really like the idea of having to share power with with others in the region. Yes, he will work with them. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but you know why why share power? And you know he's he's never seen any point in um, getting assistance from anybody else from the outside. Uh, he he got rid of um, quite frankly almost all of the aid agencies that were operational in Eritrea at independence. He either ignored them or finally just told them to, to leave. Uh, and anyone else who's tried to work with him finds the same. So, you know, unless it's on his terms and on his terms only, there's no reason why he should cooperate with anyone. Um, having said that, there are there is one major development which on which he does require cooperation, and that is a potash mine in the Dunakil, which is massive, mm-hmm. absolutely huge. And uh, that would, would co- requires cross-border cooperation with Ethiopia. And I think it is one of the drivers of the deal with the Ethiopians such as it is. Eritrea, you know, for a long time sort of sponsored insurgent groups around the region, as you mentioned, um, often Ethiopian opposition groups, um, Al-Shabaab in Somalia. Does that sort of behavior continue? I have absolutely no information that it is continuing. I think that he ended it. He saw it as being too dangerous and too uh, expensive in terms of international support and international uh, opprobrium. Um, I mean, after all, when he when he basically mended his ways and cut those ties with the Somali Islamist groups, it finally led to the lifting of uh, UN sanctions and better relations with um, some of the international uh, powers and so I suppose you know there's there's no reason w- why continue a strategy if 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 it's if it's served its purposes and I, I I have no information that he is doing it at the moment. So I want us to turn to talking about the Eritrean regime because it it is truly unique and I think I think it always bears repeating just how unique it is. Um, some have described it closer to a to a mafia state than a than a nation state. Um, how does President Isaias stay in power? I think it's by in a complex uh, way. Uh, on the one hand, um, he is extremely repressive and is prepared to put anyone, even the people he has worked with for 20, 30 years and more, in jail without trial uh, uh, indefinitely. And so he is really ruthless in what he does. Uh, I mean, the, the, the people that the, of, of Eritrea... Uh, I mean, I don't know how much you know, but I mean, for example, when you when you do your final year of schooling, you have to do it in the military academy in Sawa, uh, which is a very repressive place, very tough um, place to go into. And uh, you have to go, and that's the beginning of your military conscription. And you then uh, go through that and can be in, in military service for 20 years or more. It is indefinite. So, you know, you are, you're trapped in, in, in that system. There are also two systems which were invented during the uh, Eritrean fight for liberation from the e- Ethiopians, uh, one of which is uh, designed to spread rumours against people that he does not approve of. And the other one is to spy on anyone who basically he has any concerns about. So going right down to the village level, even into families, there are people who are required to provide information to the centre um, to, uh, you know, spy on their friends, their family, anybody else in their in their neighbourhood. And it's very much like the East German situation where there was almost nobody whom you, whom you, whom you could trust. And so you get this feeling in Eritrea of absolute uncertainty. People are worried. They're constantly looking over their shoulder, wondering, who can I trust? Who can I work with? And the answer is, you can't work with anybody because the Eritrean government will crush you. So if you compare it, say, with neighboring Sudan, in Sudan, you had all these professional organizations which were critical to the eventual overthrow of the previous regime. In Eritrea, there is nothing that looks even vaguely like that. There is no independent organization whatsoever. The only organizations which exist are those that are controlled by the state. And 
Eritrea has been put under such heavy sanctions uh, by the UN and and others. How does he manage to keep a budget? Well, actually, the sanctions were not that uh, uh, tough. They were against um, military and they were against individual named individuals. There was not a general economic sanctions as they were um, in other instances, uh, in other situations. Um, so he could have could have kept going. But the other thing is that he has, I mean, I, I, it may sound appalling to say this, but he has little concern about the fact that people are poor. Um, I mean, in, in Asmara, the capital, uh, there are almost daily cuts of power, there's little running water, there are shortages of all sorts of things, doesn't concern him whatsoever. As long as people are being disciplined and controlled, that is enough. And the country really runs on a mixture of two things, one or three things, one of which is um, peasant agriculture, about 80% of people live in, in the villages and run, the, run little farms which they survive on, the second is mining. There is some mining and that, that provides some income. And the third is the diaspora. Foreign Eritreans put a lot of money into the country because they need to support their families because their families are so poor. And as long as the money keeps flowing in, well, the president uh, has, his, has his cash. What is life like uh, for the Eritrean uh, diaspora under the shadow of this regime? In your In your book, you go through some, you know, you describe in detail sort of the long arm reach of this Asmara regime, even to, you know, the hundreds of thousands who have who have fled. Well, it, it exists, exists in a sense in the, exactly the same way as it does inside the country. There are people who will spy on you. There are people who will report on you and they will spread rumors about you. Oh, you know, he's not a very good person. Isn't he having an affair with somebody? These kind of things. If they don't like you, they'll find all sorts of things they can say about you. You are never a real true patriot. Those kind of things are spread. The other thing is that they infiltrate people into uh, foreign government services. So we, we have information recently that in the Netherlands, translators who are dealing with refugees who are applying for asylum, the translators are actually reporting back to the regime and are not even translating accurately and telling people if they make any criticisms of the Eritrean government, oh, you know, I don't think you should really be saying that. So they have all sorts of ways of working in the diaspora. They also extract money from the diaspora. There's a 2% tax. If you arrive in, shall we say, um, Denmark, and you live there for five, six years, you begin to build up a, a bit of a life for yourself, you were a student, then you may have a business, and you then want to send, shall we say, some clothes back to your family, or you want to sell a family home in Eritrea, the Eritrean um, embassy will say to you, well, before you that, do that, have you paid your 2% tax? And they don't mean the 2% tax on your current earnings. They mean the 2% tax on every penny, including student grants, from the moment you arrived in Denmark. You have to pay that. And when you have a certificate, then you are allowed to return, send the money or the clothes or whatever it is to Eritrea. Without it, you have no relationship with the country any longer. It's really repressive. And he's able to continue doing that, even though it's been officially banned legally in, in many places or, or by the United Nations. Oh, you're, you're absolutely right. It was. Uh, unfortunately, it was one of the sanctions that was lifted when sanctions against um, Eritrea for their relations with al-Shabaab and the Islamists was lifted. That was lifted, too. But uh, it is outlawed in some countries. The Canadians, for example, have been very strong on this and not allowed it. They, in fact, expelled the ambassador when he continued to push it. Um, but, uh, you know, most countries, quite frankly, Eritrea is a small country, three, four million, maybe five million people. Nobody knows there's never been a census in recent times. Um, so, uh, you know, they just uh, say, what the heck, it's not worth worrying about. And life is so difficult in Eritrea that hundreds of thousands have, you know, tried to flee to, to other countries as refugees. Uh, many of them to Europe, um, and President Isaias has also managed to to uh, have this play to his advantage as well. Well, indeed it does. It certainly plays to an advantage because 
It means that there are more people in the diaspora. It is like a safety valve. All the young kids who really are fed up with living under that kind of rule uh, flee to Ethiopia, Sudan, who still have you know huge refugee camps for, with with Eritreans in them. And then if they if they have the get up and go, and it, it requires huge courage, you find a people smuggler. He takes you through the Sahara Desert and eventually possibly to Libya. But those, the links with, between Libya and across the Mediterranean have become increasingly difficult. Uh, the, uh, since 2015, the European Union has effectively built what is an effective wall across the Mediterranean. I don't mean a literal wall, but a uh, sort of legal, legal wall across the Mediterranean. And, um, you know, in a lot of countries, you're now, uh, you know, Switzerland, for example, now puts people on the plane, even if they've got that far puts them on the plane back to back to Eritrea. So it's it's a really, really tough situation. And, you know, Europe looks at Eritrea and they see a country that sets on the, the Red Sea, which is which is, you know, strategically very vital for them. They also see all these refugees coming from from Eritrea. And yet they they see President Isaias, you know, who who rules over, you know, has one of the worst human rights records of, of any leader in the world. So how have they tried to, to deal with that? Well, they've, they've done uh, two things. The first is that they have tried to assist Eritrea by providing them with development funds um, in the hopes that Eritrea becomes more prosperous and people have a better life and therefore they don't flee. And the second thing that they have done is that they have, through what's known as the Khartoum process, they have uh, set up a series of links which provide information, it's uh, information sharing, information gathering through Interpol with the Eritrean government. Uh, As one of the many recipients of this information, there's a regional operations centre in Khartoum, which uh, has European personnel in it, who have been gathering and supplying this information. So they've been doing everything that they possibly can to end the number of uh, refugees who crossed the Mediterranean. Mustn't forget in 2015, there were a million people who arrived on Europe's shores. And there was such pressure on the European Union governments that they basically uh, said, whatever it takes, we're going to stop it. So Eritrea now is an honoured partner in this relationship. They, in fact, were chairing the whole uh, relationship between the European Union and Africa uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, they seen as an equal partner in getting anything they can. Are there any signs that this political engagement is producing any fruits? Well, not really, because uh, the uh, Eritreans basically, I mean, to put it bluntly, don't give a damn. Uh, You can offer them anything you like, but their basic attitude is, We do it on our own. So you can offer them huge amounts of money. You can offer them assistance. And they say, yeah, fine. You want to give it to us, give it to us. But it's on our terms. Uh, So there's been no shaping of the regime. There's been no lessening of the repression. Um, I mean, the many, many recommendations which were made by the UN Human Rights Commission after lengthy reports, I can't think of any that have been implemented. Are we any closer to seeing any signs of a light at the end of the tunnel, if you will, of uh, Isaias' rule? For instance, how is his health? What is the status of of internal opposition? Uh, Or is it very difficult to tell the answer to any of those questions? It's very difficult. Um, He had cerebral malaria um, some years ago, but he seems to have recovered from it. I know of no indication that he is anything but uh, well and healthy. Uh, He used to drink a lot, I was told, but um, I I think that's been moderated in recent years. So I I don't think that, uh, you know, apart from the normal ageing, that he has any real problems on that front. As for internal opposition, some people have taken, not to the streets really in recent years, but they have put up posters, they have put up slogans uh, criticising the government. But, uh, you know, you've got to be exceptionally brave to do it uh, because, you know, there's such a system of spies and network of informers that uh, who can you trust? It's really, really difficult. So, uh, you know, there's no 
indication that the the government is about to fall. Um, Having said that, you know, the one thing you can be sure about with repressive regimes like this is that you can't see the change coming until it hits you. And as you've talked about repeatedly thus far, you know, this is this is a country really just remarkably wrapped up around one figure. What might a post Isaias Eritrea look like? You know, I must be honest with you, I haven't the faintest idea. Um, the The only thing that you can look at and, and is to say that there are some positive elements. Uh, the one is that the there is no religious hostility between the Christian and the uh, Muslim communities. They've always got on pretty well. There has been tension. There was tension in the 1960s, 70s. But uh, since then, they've had good relations. And there's a real attempt by the diaspora to make sure that that continues, um, that people link up. Um, There are also, in recent years, in the diaspora, there's been a really substantial movement which has gathered force called Yakul, which is bringing people together uh, across uh, generations and across nations. And um, they're trying to make a difference and and, uh, really unite the opposition such as it is. But I'm afraid the opposition is very fragmented. There are, I don't know, 20, 30 different uh, opposition parties. Again, they are trying to unite, but there's little sign of progress. And... um, Although they they might achieve some unity, what would they do then? And there there is, in a sense, a a split uh, in the Eritrean opposition between two views. One says, we've had enough, we should fight. And the other one says, no, we've we've fought long enough, we we can't kill each other. And uh, that has been a really difficult one. There's also a Christian-Muslim split that existed within the opposition. But I do think that that is being overcome. So in a sense, if I was to be hopeful about Eritrea, I would say that, uh, you know, it is the the church and the mosque that will in the end try to pull people together and uh, hold the ring when a new government finally takes shape. I think that's a good note to end on. So so thanks, Martin, for, for coming on the podcast and, and for your time. It's, it's, it's a pleasure. Thanks for listening to The Horn. If you want to find out more about Crisis Group, visit our website at crisisgroup.org or follow us on Twitter at Crisis Group. Crisis Group has also launched a new weekly podcast, Hold Your Fire, that dives each week into a conflict around the globe. And of course, we also have a sister podcast, War and Peace, focused on Europe. I'm Alan Boswell. Join us in two weeks for our next episode. The Horn is produced by Mae Francis.